Coming Out, a weekly program produced by gay men and women for and about the homosexual community in Winnipeg. We offer news, information, and entertainment from gay people here and around the world. We've planned this program to interest our family and friends as well. So even if you're not gay, why not join us for the next half hour? We'd like you to find out more about what we're really like. Hi, welcome to Coming Out. It's sometimes argued that the personal attitudes and social structures that cause people to hate the members of one minority, homosexuals for example, are the same as those that cause them to hate other minorities, such as racial minorities. Our guest tonight is someone who's experienced both of those kinds of prejudice. He is Simon Coley, a anti-apartheid activist from South Africa who is also a member of the student tenants' rights literacy and gay liberation movements in that country. Simon, maybe you could begin by telling us how you started in the gay movement. Um, well, I firstly started in 1982. That this was when I became aware that a uh, gay movement is needed for black people in our country. But at the time, I really didn't know how to organize uh, ourselves. I didn't know who to go to, because many gay people are in are very um, invisible. You know, you, you cannot really know who is gay, who is not gay. You know, people are not written whether they're gay or not, and. Maybe I should really tell you why uh, I became so much interested on setting up a gay organization or become, uh, becoming a member of a gay organization. Um, I looked at the way I, as a person, struggled to come out, all the fight, all the emotional I went through. And I said, hang on, I wasn't alone on that situation, or I couldn't have been alone. You know, there must be other gay people who find themselves in the same situation as I am. And at the time when I thought of becoming a member of a gay organization, um, I was already went through many difficulties in my community. Uh, well, I joined a uh, gay organization finally in 1983. I joined Gay Association of South Africa. And a few days or a few months thereafter, I found that black people were not really represented in it. There were few black people going to uh, Gaza functions and the white members of that organization were very you know, sort of ignorant, or maybe they didn't like us, I don't know, but they really didn't have a good communication with them. Small membership um, of Gaza who happened to be black like I was. And I remember that there were lots of things which make me very unhappy about um, being a member of Gaza, or uh, things that makes me unhappy about how Gaza treated us. There's some example that I want to tell you about. Gaza, although it claimed that it was a uh, multiracial organization, of course, managing to have people like me in their organization, they did not really represent the demands of the black people or the needs of the black people. They did not go into the township and organize um, any function there. But instead, Gaza, uh, at the time when I was a member, they used to organize functions in places where black people could not go. Or they would advertise at the time in Linkskakel the gay bars, for example, clubs. And every time we go to these places, we, as uh, the black members of that organization, we, would, we were told that we cannot go in because that is a white-only organization. 
And then there was one incident that really happened uh, at one stage that a walk was organized, you know, a hiking trip was organized by, by Gaza. And then it was only when we arrived there that black were not welcome, you know. We used to have a very bad, uh, people in Gaza used to give us very uh, bad looks and things like that. At times they wouldn't really talk to you. If, for example, I happen to go to that function alone, as those times I used to happen to be the only black person or two or three, but if I happen to be alone, no one would ever come and speak to me. So then, because I saw all this problem, I then again spoke to some members, some black members who were members of Gaza and say, we have to do something about this. We have to organize ourselves, you know. And then that is where, when I started putting articles to the press, even to the, the normal press, you know, I remember putting articles in City Press, which is a well-read uh, paper among the black community in Johannesburg and in the area surrounding Johannesburg, and asking people to come forward and we discuss the problem of um, black gays. Anyway, our first meeting was well attended. We had about 70, more than 70 people who were there. And of course, they were white people. I think I, mu I must clarify this. Not everybody in Gay Association of South Africa were um, racist. Some few white people were still sympathetic, you know, because they could organize parties at their own house and we could go. So these um, white people that I'm talking about, we invited them to this meeting and to have a discussion of what are we going to do, how are we going to approach Gaza about certain issues, you know. Of course, in that meeting, uh, there, is, there were lots of resolutions suggested that we don't have to do anything with Gaza, we just have to, have to form our own organization. But the problem was we couldn't form our own organization. We didn't have resource. So we resolved at the end, OK, let's, let's do this. We shall remain members of Gaza, but we shall call ourselves an interest group. You know, Of course, we didn't have a name for the groups. That's why the group was called Saturday Group, because we mainly met on Saturday to discuss this um, problems that we were facing. Some of the other issues that we were really uh, faced, uh, have to face with were venues. You know, as black people, we never have resource. We never have venues where we could hold our meetings, especially because we wanted to concentrate in the township where black people live. So we organized with Gaza, I remember again that they should uh, let us to use the community center when we have meetings. I think they did allow us to have two to three meetings and then they complain again that uh, we mess up things or the people next door um, complain that we are noisy, you know, always black people have to be noisy. That is what they were actually implying. And then we managed to get somebody who was really sympathetic, a Shebin owner in Soweto. And then we held our meetings there in Soweto with white people going to Soweto to meet with us. And that time it was during the time of group areas was put in practice. Whites were not allowed to be in the townships. Blacks were not allowed to be, to be in the uh, suburbs until certain time. So it was quite, uh, you know, something that we coordinated very uh, secretly that the white people are going to Soweto to have a, uh, a gay meeting. Anyway, Saturday group went well. Most unfortunately, uh, I happened to be in the leadership of Saturday Group. I happened to initiate everything, and I think I may say I was dominating, you know, 
because lots of other gay people are still in a closet or if they are out they cannot organize themselves then in 1984 I got arrested in September and then the gay movement or Saturday group lost its leadership you know and lost me and of course I learned that people were puzzled of my detention. They didn't know why I was detained, you know, uh, because I was detained under Section 29 at the time. And even myself, when I was in detention, I was asking myself what could be the charges against me, what could the police be investigating. But all the same, I believe that uh, Gaza, some Gaza members have been telling members of Saturday group to be aware, you know, because I am arrested and then there were rumors that I am arrested because I am the chairperson or the coordinator of Saturday group and there were rumors that the police have got the list of membership, which was lies, they never got the list of membership and they, they didn't even ask me about uh, Saturday group when I was arrested. Well, that was the politics which, which was happening outside and I was in prison at the end. And then, of course, the organization that I was a full member of, that I have paid my membership fee and subscribed to their constitution, which is Gaza, failed to support me, you know. And then when I was charged, I tried to find out why they were not um, supporting me. And of course, the International Lesbian Gay Association were also doing the same thing as I was doing. They were trying hard to find out why I was not supported. And at the end, I learned that I was not supported because of, among other things, I was charged with murder or I was not charged on gay matters, which to me, it was something I didn't understand what they mean about I was not charged on gay matters, you know, what could have, uh, what could I have done, what should I have done to uh, deserve um, being charged on gay matters, you know, or maybe I should have gone to the station and do whatever they call it, soliciting, maybe that is a gay polit politics or maybe I should have <laughs> sodomized somebody or done something in public which will deserve, uh, which will make Gaza to support me. Well, at the same time, uh, I was in prison, you know, I have to deal with the fact that I was charged on treason, I was charged on terrorism and subversion together with the 21 people. And it was also um, a way of fighting for my, um, you know, for myself because I was the only gay person within 21 people. The others were all anti-apartheid activists. And yeah, they were all anti-apartheid. Uh, tenancy uh, activists. Yeah, well, uh, lucky, luckily, four of them knew when I was outside that I was a gay man, you know. And then they really did accept me as a gay person. Of course, other people, they didn't really know why, you know, why I'm gay. You know, it was just like something which is happening in the black community. Uh, the black community don't believe that a person can be gay, especially if you're a black. You, you can't be gay. That must be something wrong. It's, or, in, you know, they always say um, homosexuality. It's not um, something that happens in a normal black people. That is a, a disease that white people brought from the West. That is how the um, politicians, the black politicians argued. And the black community, of course, they will say, we've never heard of a black man saying he's a homosexual. That is a white disease. Only white people can be that, you know. and. We, I have to really face the whole issue to, again with my core defendant and say, listen, this is actually what is happening. And at the same time, the International Lesbian Gay Association 
or individual gay people and other gay creepings made things easier for me because they started writing to me firstly as a person asking me uh, what can we do for you you know in your, to make your situation better in prison and then all I will tell them is that if ever you do any kind of a support for me as a person that will cause another harm for me I think if you do any kind of supporting you should give that support not to me as a person but to all of us to the 22 of 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 us and i remember we used to get cards from different people i remember i gave uh, um, the names and addresses of the people who were in uh, who were with me in this trial to another gay organization in scotland and they really wrote to all of us, you know, and that really make uh, the attitude of my friends to change a bit. I had another problem just before I went to give evidence, you know. Uh, some people were not happy that I should give evidence in case the state bring up the issue of me being a homosexual person among the leaders, you know, among the community leader. And I regarded myself as a community leader, and if the whole issue comes up, I would have to deal with it. I did ask my lawyers, you know, what can I do about the whole issue? And they really advised me that, Simon, you are charged here on high treason, and when you go to the witness box, you will defend yourself on the things that you didn't do, and on the things that your organization and the organization of the 21 of you didn't do. And once you deny the fact that you are gay in a witness box, and then the state can prove that it is true you are, then your whole evidence will be destroyed. Anyway, apart from that adv uh, advance from the lawyer, I was not going to turn back and say, I mean, for example, if the prosecutor did ask me, Simon, it is true that you're gay, and I will just tell him that it's true, and so what? I was not charged of, on homosexuality, charged. I was charged on political um, um, charges. And so it happened that I, go, I went to the witness box at the end, and the state didn't bring it up. But I used the tactic of bringing it up myself because of um, some of the allegations against the state it was that we attended meetings to incite people to mobilize the black masses against the government of South Africa. But then, some of the meetings, I didn't attend them. Some, when I was asked about one particular meeting, which was a force that I attended that meeting, I just told them, no, I didn't attend that meeting. And the next question was, do you remember where you were? on that day, and I told them, yes, I do remember, I was in Soweto, I was going to address a gay meeting, a gay a meeting organized by Gay Association of South Africa. And then what would he do? I volunteered to bring the whole issue up, and I think I was really brave to do that, and I helped to cut other questions down on my, on my part. And of course, I did that to cut questions and also to make it visible that there are gay people existing in our community. And then when I had finished giving evidence, which means I was the shortest witness, everything changed. I got a good welcome from my, uh, my co-accused in a witness box. And at the end, everything went, went, went well. And then, when I was released on bail, uh, I was not allowed to take part in any political organization. So um, I happened to take part in gay uh, uh, politics again, you know, by forming the organization that I am the chairperson of at the moment. And that organization is still existing, and I'm happy that it is there to help those people who are coming out. 
our main concern is that there are lots of people who are faced with tragedy of coming out. And some of these people, because they are not brave enough to face the community, I mean, our community is very hostile towards gay. The black community are the most hostile people towards gay, um, towards men who are homosexuals. So you find that at some stage, lots of people commit suicide, or they run away of the family, or they disappear. We don't really know what happens. Or they happen to lead unhappy life, because the only choice if you're a black person and to avoid being prosecuted by other black people, by your family, is to get married. So they end up getting married against their choice, you know, against their will. And then you find lots of unhappy family if it is not going to be a divorce. And our organization is committed to fight for the rights of gay and lesbian people in our uh, townships. Do you think that the hostility which whites in South Africa, for example, feel towards blacks, their attitudes and their sense that whites are superior to blacks and that whites ought to earn more and own more and, and control more than blacks, do you think that is the same as the attitude which heterosexuals, black heterosexuals, have towards homosexuals, that, that heterosexuals are superior and ought to be the only type of relationship to be allowed? Is, are those two things in the mind the same? I think it is. I think it is the same because lots of, um, I mean, in the country that I come, to, I come from is that the blacks don't have and the whites have, you know. I'm talking about the money thing and the power as well. I think, um, I'm not actually generalizing, I'm, I don't say all the whites are, but it is um, designed in that, in that way, you know. Um, you discover, I discovered among the black people that when they have a white lover, they are in a paradise, you know. Mm -hmm. They found themselves very lucky because then the white person having the monies will look after the black person. And it's something that um, I personally uh, don't agree with, you know. I believe you should have all work. But the system of apartheid had designed that some people who have and those who have not have to submit themselves to those who have, you know. So the power struggle is there with, between gays of, between gays of colors, you know, of black, black and white. And of course, um, I remember also about the incidents that white people would really think of black, I mean, some white people think black people because they are, they deserve money, they need money. So it's quite easy for them to, um, to, use, to use them, you know, to use black people for their own interest, their own sexual interest. So our organization is actually opposed to that. But I mean, in our system, the system of apartheid, there is nothing at the moment we can do, you know. We can just uh, mobilize the people to really take care, you know, whatever they do, they should never let themselves to be used. But we are in a society that blacks use white to get money and vice versa. So uh, there would be an interesting set of paradoxes here. First of all, interracial relationships amongst gays mm. would experience the same problems of simply existing, surely, that interracial relationships amongst heterosexuals would, that you would have the matter of being seen on the streets together or finding a place to live, which was somehow, I mean, it would always be illegal, them living together in South Africa. They couldn't live legally in a black area or a white area. Mm. Well, it is actually people who, who, have, who happen to have uh, relationship across the color bar, if they do live together, they live as 
boss and a boy, you know, a master and a boy. This mm. is just my gardener. That mm. is can that can be used as an excuse, and a lot of people do use them as an excuse, you know. Mm. So, to make uh, other members of the society not aware that these people are having relationship, a white person can have a live-in boy at the back side of the 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 house, you know, mm -hmm. a court, a courtyard or something. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in the township, of course, white people cannot go there. <laughs> they cannot live in the township. It's rare that you found that lots of white people living in a township. Mm -hmm. But that is not a problem alone. Another problem is that even two black people who have relationship, they cannot live happily in the township. You know, in fact, that is the problem that is caused by the housing um, that we live in uh, overcrowding places you know S we live with our families we live with our mothers and our aunts and so it's very difficult for a black person to bring his lover home you know even if your mother my mother ac accept me luckily but even if though I cannot bring my uh, my lover home and stay and spend weekend with him at my mother's place. So you're faced with problems of always the true poverty and crowding and yeah. uh, the assignment of living quarters only to what are recognized as legitimate families. And so yeah. on. I'm afraid we have to end this, Simon. Our time is up. If you're interested in more information about the conditions affecting gays and lesbians in South Africa or in any other country of the world, why not drop by the library of the Winnipeg Gay and Lesbian Resource Centre, which contains books and periodicals from all over the world. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. Good night. I got a letter from a friend who knew I was gay who t suddenly told me he didn't want to see me anymore. And my reactions to the letter, I realized, were a lot stronger than they should have been for just a friendship that was breaking up. And it wasn't until then that I realized I was in love with him. And that's when my Catholic bringing, bringing up hit me in that this must be what they're all talking about. This is where it's wrong. Men can't feel this strongly for men. Uh, if, if, if I'm going to be a homosexual, then this is how I'm going to have to live my life with all this great pain and threat and very unhappiness sort of thing. So I decided I was going to be straight. So when I came back to Winnipeg to University, I contacted the psychology department there and started therapy sessions. I used to go twice a week to start with. And as I got closer to being cured, got to once a week, once a month, most of the, basically what it is, when you're in the offices, I had electrodes tied to my, I guess, the back of my hand. And any time that I would look at a photo of a naked man or fantasize about a naked man, I would get a bolt of electricity. Which was painful. I think. Oh, yes. And it would increase as you went on with it because your body builds up resistance to it. So week by week, whatever, it would get a little higher. 
But if I was looking at pictures of, of women or fantasizing about women, then I could take as long as I wanted with the fantasy or by looking at the photo. There was no problem. Um, I also, this was in the painful part, but kind of embarrassing part, I had a counter that I had to carry around with me. And any time there was a homosexual fantasy or a thought, I had to record the number. Uh, and it would go down because your body's resisting to the pain. You don't <laughs> want the pain. <laughs> uh, that went on for about, I guess the first part went about for a year and a half. And then uh, they pronounced me cured. I was dating women. I still had never had sex with a woman. I still haven't. But the fantasies had disappeared. It had been, I don't know, two, three months without any homosexual fantasies. Um, so I was pronounced cured. Was there any heterosexual element apart from going out and dating women? I mean, there was only one episode, and I, th I, I can't remember what they were trying to do, but they had their secretary come in, and we just had to sit and chat as if we were on a date yeah. to see how well I would, I guess, how comfortable I'm going to be with her. At the same time, you've got two other people staring at you, <laughs> a woman I don't know, yeah. and she's trying to pretend that she's cool and with it and that we're good friends or whatever, and it just felt so awkward. But right. <laughs> well, when, they, when you say they were saying that you were cured, how did they know? I mean, why did they say that? Well, because the digital counter for the homosexual things had gotten to zero. Yeah. I was fantasizing about women in their part of the sessions. You create your own fantasies, discuss your own fantasies. They sort of cultivate this. Mm -hmm. And I was being physically aroused by the fantasies, so it seemed that I was on the road to cure. Mm -hmm. But I, after the first year and a half or whatever, uh, six months later, I was getting the fantasies again, so I went back for a, another dose, lasted for about two months, and left there again, and then another six months later, the fantasies, homosexual fantasies, came back again, and that's when I decided not to go back. Why? Uh, quite a few things happened. I was a Catholic. I had left the church. Um, at that time, I believe I left the church, I told myself I left the church, because I was tired of all the hypocrites that go to church on Sunday and gamble and sin and everything on Monday and pretend they're holier than thou. Uh, but after these fantasies came back the third time, the homosexual fantasy started back again, I was at a point of trying to find my own spiritual spirituality as well. I had gone to a group called Dignity, or at least I heard about a group. They hadn't been in Winnipeg yet. I read about them. And I had been to the, my first gay bar on a Saturday night and was very comfortable there with all these strangers. But they were people who were like me. We didn't have to make pretense of anything. And the Sunday morning, thinking about dignity and its belief that you can be gay and Catholic and God still loves you, thinking about the relationship I felt or the closeness I felt with the people Saturday night, and thinking about the aversion therapy, it just suddenly struck me that what I was doing was trying to deny something that I am. For whatever reason, God created me gay. Mm -hmm. and trying to be ver go through aversion therapy to change something that is a given is like trying to I don't know, change the color of your skin. It's a given. You can't do it. And also th the relationship, if I ever did fall in love with a woman, I could picture myself saying, you know, not tonight, dear, I didn't get my shock. <laughs> Which is pretty degrading to her. <laughs> not to say anything to the whole degrading of personal relationships that it, I'd have to be punished, physically punished, in order to feel something for uh, someone of the opposite sex. And I said, no, this isn't it. And at the same time I'm thinking of it, it all dawned on me. The reason I left the church was because I believed what everyone was telling me was that God didn't love me. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the, there was no place for me. The church didn't want me. God didn't want me. In reality, God always wanted me. God never left me. And I just had to learn to f live with who I am and to live according to the teachings and what I was by my purpose in life. Let's go back to the therapy for a minute. It sounds like it did have some, at least, temporary impact on you. Do you think it actually changed, at least temporarily, your sexual orientation, or was it a purely superficial? Uh, I would think it's purely superficial. If it had wor worked, I wouldn't be having to go back a second or a third or, or possibly a fourth time. Yeah. Uh, about a year after I came out the second time, I was involved with uh, workshops at the hospital, and the, t the students go through a day where they meet with and see films on homosexuality and lesbians. And I was one of the ones asked to work with a, be a part of a small group. They break into discussion groups. So I said, yes, I'd go be the token homosexual for this one group. When I walked into the room where the other psychiatrists were going to be also break into the small groups, 
the one doctor I had been through aversion therapy with was there. And I went up to him and I said, well, guess what? <laughs> <laughs> and he just looked at me and says, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I guess it didn't work, did it? And he said, looked at me and says, do, do you do any harm? I said, no. Then it wasn't the wrong thing to do. Mm -hmm. and in that light, it sort of made me think that, yes, it was something that I had to go through to be able to convince myself that this is what I am. So what it, in fact, did, though, was temporarily persuade you to try to be a heterosexual? It temporarily persuaded me that I was, mm. at, because the fantasies and the feelings of the homosexual that were always, always been there were now buried or camouflaged, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the mind didn't want to face the pain that would come with them. Mm -hmm. But once the, the body adjusted its factor to itself again, that there was not going to be pain for thinking about these things, mm -hmm. they came out again. Mm -hmm. So really, your heterosexual interests were entirely dependent on the therapy itself on the administration of electric shocks. In for a me, it was yes. Carefully controlled setting. Uh, for me, I, 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 as I say, I've never still have never had sex with a woman, mm. and so I, I've never felt as close to a woman as I have with the men that I've in my life. Uh, so the aversion therapy was did nothing but camouflage a natural tendency. Yeah. Uh, have you any idea whether this is a general experience amongst uh, gay people who've taken aversion therapy, whether they have this sort of short shelf life? <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you phrase that. Yeah. From what I understand, it's not, first off, aversion therapy is not being used as much as it used to be because people realize that it doesn't do as it was intended, particularly for dealing with sexual orientation. And from the ratings and so forth, yes, most people who have gone through it end up coming back or going out, whatever the word you want to phrase, they do end up being homosexual again. Their tendencies come out. Yeah. I mentioned this once to a um, psychiatrist and he said oh well aversion therapy is useful for things like stopping people from smoking it governs or can can condition behavior he said it's a sophisticated form of nagging in the same way that parents <laughs> persuade their children through admonition and punishment to behave in a certain way but it can't affect your nature but he said there was a lot of mystery attached to, attached to sexuality people supposed that how you behaved sexually somehow necessarily reflected your inner feelings but as gay people we know of course that it's easy to pretend to be heterosexual. Oh, yes, it's easy. Lots of gay people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all think that everyone had some time or other, well, the vast majority, anyways, have had some time or other have had to pretend. I think now there's a lot of young people at age 13, 14, they know or they un identify their feelings as gay and don't play the games. Of, but most of us in our age, we're getting older and a few younger, have had to go through a period of being heterosexual. Yeah. Well, this, this fellow also remarked, he said, that one of the unmysterious things about sex is you could be trained to react to anything. The use of aversion therapy could be employed to train you to react sexually to pictures of bicycles or something. I don't <laughs> really, do you think that's so? That, you know, if they just substituted other pictures besides naked women, it could have been anything else? That's an interesting thought. I wonder what it would have about. <laughs> Probably because the whole idea is to punish the body to, to think the way they want you to think. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, if they wanted to turn somebody into someone who was attracted to bicycles, I suppose they could. Might take a lot longer to do, but <laughs> I suppose they could. Yeah, might wear off quickly. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be very unsatisfying. <laughs> very one way. Yeah. Um, did you, you said that it hadn't harmed you, um, but uh, I got the impression that there was a period of when you very much wanted to be not homosexual and be heterosexual. Uh, did you ever get any suggestion from the people who administered the therapy that you you know, that you were all right if you were gay, and it was all right if it didn't work? As a matter of fact, I did. The first psychiatrist I went to, the first doctor I went to, told me flat out that there was nothing they could do. I was homosexual, I would be homosexual the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And that's not what I wanted to hear, mm -hmm. I wanted to hear rather. So I went to another doctor. Shopping. <laughs> that's right. Uh, the second doctor told me, quite honestly, he said, if you want to be homosexual, or if you are homosexual, we can deal with your problems your negative feelings on that. Uh, we can't guarantee that aversion therapy will work. It is your decision. Mm -hmm. That you, what you want to be is up to you. We'll help you be whatever it is you want. Mm -hmm. So, and they that told me this at the interview, and they told me again at the first session when we started aversion therapy. Yeah. So they were prepared. Mm -hmm. I wasn't. Mm -hmm. Well, didn't you feel badly when you kept reverting back to being a homosexual, having spent the time and effort, not to mention all the shocks? Well, the second time I did feel a little guilty. It took me a little, lot longer to call them than I should have. But the third time I, w I wasn't guilty. I didn't feel guilty because that's when things started to gel. This is who I am. Mm. 
Have you had any experience with other types of therapy? And they're meant, or any knowledge people who've used other mechanisms to try and not be homosexual? I personally have not used any other means. Uh, most people, I know, I'm just trying to think. I've talked to so many people. Most either just abstain, become celibate, and one of the things dignity does is try to help to maintain that celibacy. Uh, others have just, some people have gone into seminaries thinking that, or religious life, thinking that once they become sanctified, mm -hmm. blessed, that they'll have no problem. Does it work? No. <laughs> I, we've had one fellow who went in for four years and came out, mm -hmm. came back to dignity. He was worse than when he went in because the doctrines are still, what the church teaches, are still very oppressive. Mm -hmm. So instead of trying to find a, a place to heal, it was a place that just oppressed him more and more and more. Mm -hmm. So when he came out, there was more of a liberation that had to be done with him. I was just thinking uh, psychotherapy is something where there's an intense relationship developing between the patient and the physician, um, in which the, the patient is anxious to satisfy the physician in order to achieve the cure that's wanted, where aversion therapy seems a somewhat more mechanical thing. At least you're only disappointing a machine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the only one that counts is you getting this machine. So. Yeah. And uh, what made me think of that, there's a story in a, a book called The Homosexual Matrix by a psychologist named Tripp in which he approached another psychiatrist named Socrates, who was well known because he'd published a great many case histories in which homosexuals seemed to be cured. And he'd asked Socrates for and the opportunity to interview some of these people. And he couldn't contact any of them. They had passed through psychotherapy, sometimes hundreds and hundreds mm -hmm. of hours, spent thousands of dollars, and then disappeared. And he wondered, and I wondered, if that disappearance of these patients, completely out of the contact of the psychiatrist who presumably cured them, was because maybe they, it hadn't lasted, you know, it hadn't worked, and they, they had disappointed this man that he'd spent hundreds of hours <laughs> in his interview. Ruined his whole thesis yeah. <laughs> and wanted to hide so they wouldn't know. I suspect it's somewhat the same. I watched one program in Phil Donahue on ex-gays, and, I th and there was a psychi the psychiatrist on, and he kept trying to come back to where he wasn't saying that every gay can be cured and that his methods were not a cure. Yeah. Uh, I think what you do, you, our society has labeled everything black and white. You're gay or you're heterosexual. Mm -hmm. Forgetting there's a lot of people in the, who are bisexual, mm -hmm. and there's a very small amount who are exclusively gay. Mm -hmm. If anyone, to my mind, anyone who is cured mm -hmm. in whatever way, they've either suppressed their own gayness by, I don't know what, machines or psychology or whatever, or they're actually bisexual to start with and now concentrating on their heterosexual tendency as opposed to the gay tendency, or they were never gay to start with. They had gay experiences that they liked and labeled themselves gay, which still happens with young people nowadays. You know, mm -hmm. they'll have one or two episodes with their close friend, and suddenly they're in the psychiatrist's office, they're at home, they're crying, I'm gay, mm -hmm. and they're not. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I suppose when you view it as a disease, I can remember reading one pamphlet in which a, a, a man claimed to have been homosexual and to have been or saved, what it, his homosexuality amounted to was the anxiety that he might be homosexual. Well, if you label homosexuality as disease, any sort of mental disturbance in which homosexuality appears <laughs> yes. as a topic <laughs> <laughs> constitutes the disease of homosexuality, more or less. So someone who used to worry about being homosexual, however wrongly, and has, been, has his anxiety at least diminished, can now claim he's a, a cured homosexual. I think it's also, too, a lot of them just stop having sex. Mm -hmm. uh, they're celibate, mm -hmm. so therefore they think that they're no longer homosexual. But we don't know what their fantasies or their, their own natural tendencies are. And the fact that you're just not having sex doesn't mean that you're switched from homosexuality to heterosexuality or vice versa. Well, that you wouldn't have great satisfaction if you did have a yes. homosexual relationship. Well, I've noticed that too. It seemed to me when I first became involved, the various medical and religious organizations used to say that people were changed from being homosexual then to being heterosexual now. Well, now it seems to me they mostly call themselves ex-gay organizers. They're not saying they're heterosexual. They're simply saying they're not gay anymore. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I get back to this idea of celibacy. It usually means that they're not having sex. Yes. And that constitutes a material thing. Well, it's part of a fallacy, again, based on our society. That it's when you talk about homosexuality, most people still think only of sex. Yeah. And homosexuality covers everything in your life, not just your, who you're having sex with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, your uh, involvement with religious organizations, I suppose, might have brought you in contact with the religious uh, organizations or bodies that try to save homosexuals. Are they any more successful than the medical ones? No, they like to think they are, but again, I have to say no. You're again dealing with, dealing with people who have gone into celibacy because this is a particular Catholic church. That's the only lifestyle acceptable for the, uh, uh, a gay person in the Catholic church. So they become celibate, and they therefore say that they are no longer gay. That hasn't changed anything. It just means they're not having sex. Mm -hmm. uh, others who have, they like to think that because of their faith, they believe and therefore they are cured. To me, they have become, I have to choose my words carefully, sort of brainwashed into another area where the born again thinks so much of only of God and the goodness that they're spending all their sexual energies preaching and running around worshiping God and not really being a full person. Mm -hmm. They have, and I think by denying their full person, they are again denying part of their orientation. Well, it would explain some of the passion that people put into the re religious experience. They simply sort of rechannel their some of their sexual energies. And, and to me, and I don't say this just because of Christians, but anything, any any fanatic, I tend not to listen to because they're not willing to listen to the truth. They believe they have the, or I shouldn't say the truth. They're not listen, willing to listen to anything. Period. Mm -hmm. They have the answer. We have the way. Do it our way. Period. Mm -hmm. Don't think I'm right. And anybody in that way, you can't talk with them. They're, you're not, they're not open to listening, to learning. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that all Christians all face, you have to learn as you're into your society, what is this society about? What does God's message mean here? Mm -hmm. You have to be able to listen to what other people are saying, and they're not willing to listen. Mm -hmm. So it just becomes another defense mechanism to cut off things they don't want to deal with. Well, uh, I don't know if it's uh, quite apropos, although the business of, of talking and not listening applies to this. Um, uh, I knew a, a clergyman once who had tried to contact people who, whose story appeared in pamphlets, ex, so-called ex-gays. And he said he, they, they seemed, didn't seem to last as long as the pamphlets. <laughs> <laughs> He'd gotten the literature, but he couldn't, writing back to them, he couldn't reach, make contact with those people whose names or whose experience was in the literature, which I wondered if maybe there's sort of a standard shelf life for ex-gays, however achieved, whether medically or religiously, and it took about six months to realize. And even in the pamphlets, he showed me some of them, they often said in them that they continued, as they put it, to suffer from the old temptations and they had to work. So they weren't really ex-gays no, at case, all. No. Even that hadn't been achieved. I know that the National, or the United Church is, has a national board dealing with the topic of whether homosexuals and lesbians, known homosexuals and lesbians, should be ordained. They have on their board, I think, three ex-gays. Mm -hmm. So the United Church is having to deal with all that sort of thing, too. But again, over time, I don't think you have those ex-gays around very long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the business of having sexual experience. There must be, in any society, a fair accumulation of people who've had what amount to homosexual experiences because they were with another person of the same sex in things like prisons and boarding schools and the military, which was merely a matter of um, sexual release. Now, if these people become concerned or even obsessed with the notion that this makes them a homosexual, it would be easy for them to later decide. Exactly. I mean, they wouldn't even have to make an effort to realize that they were... The mind is capable of doing quite a few things. If they've had these episodes and they've enjoyed them for whatever reason, yeah. the mind will convince you that if I've enjoyed this with a man, I must be gay. Yeah. So they go through the whole trauma and reality. They've taken advantage of a particular situation, time and place. I could have sex with a woman. wouldn't make me heterosexual. Yeah. Well, I suppose m most of the people really don't know much about homosexuality, and so it's easy for them to think what they want. It's all the mind games. It's what society tells you again. So if they go, these people go to a psychiatrist and are pronounced cured, they will think that they were. Mm. Well, why, why can't, I mean, for people who are gay, like yourself, who went through these therapies or through some sort of religious salvation, when you think the human mind is capable of so much, why can't it <laughs> succeed? <laughs> why can't you become either at least ex-gay, if not actually gay? Uh, Positively heterosexual. Because there are certain things that the mind, w I cannot convince with my mind, convince myself that I'm black. Yeah. I'm not. I can't convince myself that I'm blonde. Yeah. I can't convince myself that my eyes are green. These are part of me that can't be changed. Mm -hmm. And the orientation is a part of me that can't be changed. Yeah. One of the few things the Catholic Church has done that's been positive in their uh, um, or whatever thing, like encyclical, 
on the declaration of certain sexual ethics is to distinguish between homosexual, two types of homosexuality. Those who are so as, through circumstances, as you've described, those who are so through some innate instinct. Mm -hmm. Doesn't care or care, or, or doesn't mention or try to analyze where, psychologically or nutritionally, whatever, genetically, doesn't matter. Your innate instinct is a given. And the others are just sort of circumstantial. They did it because it was a form of release that was most convenient to them. Right. And even, but the problem is that the church will say, even if you're a homosexual through innate instinct, you still cannot express your orientation physically. Mm -hmm. But at least it distinguishes between the types. And to my mind, the so-called ex-gays and the cured gays are probably the ones who are so either through circumstances or have simply used their mind to shut off the natural feelings. Which is still there in the back of their... Their soul. Their innate thing. instinct for it's still there. Yeah. Well, certainly when I was young, uh, nobody thought it was all right to be homosexual. And I don't suppose it was easy if, to be, have a homosexual lifestyle, unlike today. So that anyone of our age or older must, in some very significant extent or other, tried to be heterosexual, as most of us at least pretended to do. So that I suppose you could have considered all of society as in a great aversion therapy chamber. <laughs> yes. Which <laughs> failed in a great many cases, obviously. Right? Family and church and friends all telling you what you have to do. Yeah. That's why a lot of gays end up being married, because either it's a, they hoped it was going to cure them, or it was what they were supposed to do to keep defend themselves from society. Well, ironically, I suppose in this failure of medicine and religion to influence homosexuals, there's something reassuring for heterosexuals because they seem so often to be concerned that they can be influenced, that our public presence, our assertion that it's, it's not bad, that it's okay to be gay, will somehow sort of seduce them or lure them. <laughs> <laughs> and if homosexuality is as irreducible as it evidently is, so surely is heterosexuality, that they, our presence or our public being is not going to um, cause them or their heterosexual children, for that matter, who presume to be even more vulnerable, into uh, heterosexuality is just as permanent. Oh, yes. A lot more permanent. <laughs> I guess it's just the same, right? Just as long as we both been existing side by side for the mm. beginning of time, practically. But it's also, it, it's a whole sort of, sort of thing. If we can cure a homosexual, then we can change a heterosexual, but why? Yeah. Well, perhaps that's the bottom line, is that people can just relax and stop worrying about it? Yes. That the effort was a waste of time to begin with? It, and it's not something that's chosen, so therefore, Everyone has to learn to live with whatever their orientation is and to accept other people's orientations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I suppose organizations like Dignity, because of the history of cultural change, really are organizations of ex-ex-gays. That's an interesting mm -hmm. thought. <laughs> I've probably, or I'm trying to think now, the majority of the people that I've met, I think just about every one of us, or most of the males in, in Dignity, have gone through religious training first and then came out, mm -hmm. both out of religious life and out of the closet. I'm not sure that the women, though, have ever really been ex. They've, they've seemed to move well, more comfortably They started off, I suppose, are. women being sort of neutral, and at least being imagined to be th neutral, or thinking of themselves as being, sex had such a bad name, <laughs> For <laughs> such women, bad period. reputation. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, yes, yeah, so there's it a lot of people ending it who have gone through either aversion or psychological brainwashing from the church or a lot of oppression, you know, mm -hmm. what we're doing is, is helping them be more of themselves, mm -hmm. accept themselves as who they are. Sounds like a really good news movement in that <laughs> sense. It's funny because that's what the conservatives call theirs, but dignity is something that says, look, there's something you don't have to worry about, it's a good thing. Well, it's, it's, it's odd. It's the use of language again that we have to be careful what we say mm -hmm. because, it, yes, it is good news. And in a sense, we are born again. Mm -hmm. But those phrases have been monopolized by the conservatives and changed their meaning mm -hmm. so much that we don't, you don't want to use the words. I felt like I had a born again experience when I accepted myself. As a gay person. A and the fact that God loved me as a gay person. Now, what are you going to do with it? But if I said that to a born again Christian from the conservative side, they would, let, they would understand it at all. Yeah. Well, maybe they will uh, sooner or later. Ken, <laughs> we have to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you next week. Thank you for joining us. Good night.